the show comes alive with the sound of music. Find out what it's all about, coming up next on All American People. Good morning. Welcome to All American People. This morning we're at the Holiday Cottage at Brook Green Gardens, one of the South's most amazing destinations. We're focused on the Long Bay Symphony and we're visiting with its music director and conductor, Dr. Charles Jones Evans. Good morning, Good morning Dr. Evans. You. Do you mind if we call you Charles? I think that would be fine. Actually, you know, Dr. <laughs> Evans sounds good. It you, does, but we go way back. That's so. right, absolutely. <laughs> a maestro, of course, is very popular. If you'd popular. like, sure. You know, it's uh, amazing, and you really do wear a lot of hats. I suppose. Uh, a lot of hats I wouldn't necessarily want to wear, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's sort of, in some ways, like being in business for yourself. And when, in a, when you have a small nonprofit, you never know what comes up, and you will do whatever it takes to get the product out there, make sure people know about it, make it the best it can be, you know. So in that respect, yes, you wear a lot of hats. One wears a lot of hats. This hat in the Horry County area has been worn for... How many years now? Fifteen years. Son I think of a this gun. is my fifteenth season. Yeah, it's amazing how time flies. That is, and of course, to think it was at such an early uh, organization. I mean, it had only been around less than a decade when you arrived. Right, I, I believe so. And of course, I was brought in on the heels of a of a nasty political situation, a uh, split mm -hmm. with some of the people involved with the symphony, and um, so fortunately that has long since subsided and we're just focused in on making this area's professional orchestra something that the area can be proud of. Yes, yes. Hearing the word professional is probably not something that a lot of folks know about. They don't well, I know, and I think that's important. I think the, the people who attend our concerts and regularly uh, enjoy this type of music uh, have become very aware of it. I think that the, the level of quality, I'm proud to say, has really uh, I don't mean to say improved because it was good before, but it, it right. continues to progress. Right. And I think people feel very satisfied with the professional level of the music making when they come and hear a concert. Mainly because these are people who are from all over the country. Right, right. All over the Northeast, certainly. I mean, folks from Ohio, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And they, they come here, I think, uh, in many respects, not expecting a lot. Right. Not just uh, as far as a symphony orchestra, but lots of things. They think, oh, it's so lovely here, but I probably won't have this or that. And mm -hmm. I think it's just a great testimony to this area that many things are coming, uh, have, have been in place here that, that would surprise people. And it really does. And whether you get out into the audience on a regular basis or have a chance to get out there, my daughter and I attended a performance in January, seated next to a couple from Cleveland down right. visiting and said, this is a gym we didn't even know about. Exactly. It was our first well, time. That, I, I feel like uh, we, we go over the same phrases so often uh, among the staff. And uh, I, I actually want to print a t-shirt that, that has our, fav our favorite phrase, I had no idea. <laughs> and that's the thing, people, I, and I think it's, primarily or largely due to the fact that we're in such a touristy market, right. there's so much marketing out there, right. it's hard for a nonprofit to market itself well. Right. So it's understandable that people wouldn't necessarily have an idea because we can't afford to compete with all of the, you know... For-profit uh, businesses yeah, trying yeah. to get their name out. And there's nothing wrong with that, it's just right. that whereas in a, in a community that doesn't have all that, the symphony would probably be a lot more apparent. Right. It's not so much here. I and mean, then people come and they go, wow, this is fantastic. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. so. So, and you wouldn't be the only one wearing that t-shirt <laughs> if you could get that slogan on there. And how have you yeah. all as a group, whether it's the board of directors or the, the yeah. small staff that you operate on, how have you all tried to find, is there a way to, to, uh, to overcome that? Oh, I think, I think it's overcome in the long term. Right. And that, I think that's, that's an interesting uh, aspect of it because for years early on when uh, you know my time here we would try things and it just it, we didn't seem to get a, a substantial audience mm -hmm. because at that time it was probably more specialized more rarefied for the broader community here 
Uh, so we would get several hundred, which was nice. Right. Uh, but I think that it was just, it's what I call specific gravity. We get to the point where we've, we've put it out there and put it out there and marketed this and you know, people, after a while, hear enough about it, they finally come. Right. And when they come, they realize, yes, this is, this is great, this is I miss real. this. Yeah, yeah. And so I think after a while, we reach that specific gravity to where now our audiences are over a thousand, in the you thousand, know, into yeah. 1,200, 1,400. Sure for a norm, that's our norm, right. you know, so that's much more natural. And I, I think there was no trick to that. There's no uh, specific thing you do. You just mm -hmm. keep doing what you, what you know is best. And even if you don't get those results right away, you get them over the years, over it, the long it's haul. It just at the time had to pass. And of yeah. course, it's, it, what's so critical is having had somebody like yourself willing to be around, a professional who could be anywhere, and I know you have performed both as a music director and as a uh, as a maestro as a conductor in a heck of a lot of places Charles you surely could have been to many other places but said this is where I'm gonna be in the continuity for you your willingness to be here and to stay here when I'm sure people have come after you what during your tenure here your willingness to stay here has truly helped change those numbers from a couple hundred into well over a thousand well I like to think so and I you know just to change the verbiage a little bit it's it's I would say more than willingness it's it's eagerness to stay right. here and okay. and it's that same as we had talked about before this this idea of what's very special about this place mm -hmm. I mean there are people moving here all the time the right. economy up or down right. we still have this influx of people and mm -hmm. it's a very special group of people because they're coming from all these places right. that have these services so it's much more upbeat uh, to work in a place like this and to envision what the orchestra or anything could be mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. when you've got all that potential as opposed to being in a say a flat community right. where the economy is pretty much set and the progression is either either static or in reverse in case right. of like a town that's got some industry to it that's dying off this is just moving forward all the time and so it, it keeps me very very positive about yes. the mission and and it's very rewarding to be a part of that. It's also a big challenge though as well it Charles is. because they come off and on from big cities they were decided to retire here yeah, they're used to some very high I know, level. But, but see I think I, yeah. I think we've got that licked. Right. I think that's the thing that we hear that's most uh, encouraging yeah. is that people you, and I uniformly say to me, or I hear from, uh, you know, they said to others, that this is every bit as good as what they had, oh, you yeah. know. And, oh, yeah. and, you know, you get some people, oh, every bit as good as the New York Philharmonic. Well, great. I'm happy they think that. Right. It, uh, to my mind, it's, we're close enough you can't, that, that a lot of people can't tell the difference. No. And so it's a good orchestra, and we get good folks from all around the region, just like every other orchestra does. Right. I mean, right. everywhere from... Uh, Fayetteville to Augusta to Charleston. I mean, this is a pool of highly trained professionals mm -hmm. who are going to be on the road working with a bunch of different orchestras. Right. Is it tough for you to single out, I mean, within a, a large gym like that, is there anything in particular that folks, if they've attended the, the New York Philharmonic or if they've been traveling around to symphonies, seeing orchestras all over the world, is there something you say, you've got to see us do it this, you've got to see that, or is it just your entire crew mm. uh, performing? I, I just think it's the idea that, that they will appreciate the level and not feel that it's a compromise on what they're used to. Right. Plus, I, I, I am proud of the innovative programming that we do. Now, you you said you came to that January came to concert. The one in January. And it was, uh, it was a spiritual program, but oh, in the yeah. broadest sense. And what I'm always trying to do is illustrate the, the uh, strong presence and the validity and relevance of the symphony orchestra right. in people's daily lives. So that we were looking at spiritual music, yes, spirituals and gospel music, right. but also the music of Mendelssohn, who wrote mm -hmm. uh, you know, a piece that was very spiritually based on his uh, conversion to Christianity. Uh, Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, you know, that spiritual element that's in the music. Mm -hmm. So it was a way to, to look at that idea from a very um, broad perspective, and mm -hmm. I think that created the appreciation. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've done, you know, wonderful epic things like The Planets, which right. is you know, one of the great, oh, great yeah. works. This last concert we did uh, to close the symphony season, the symphony series, uh, was kind of a an instructional for the orchestra and it was a, an excuse for us to do 
uh, a very large orchestral piece, which was the Ravel, uh, part of the Ravel Ballet, Daphne and Chloe, mm. which involved, you know, basically 85 musicians on the stage, plus the Carolina Master Chorale. Wow. So you had about you know, 160, 170 musicians on stage just washing the audience with this huge sound. And uniformly, mm -hmm. people were just blown, blown away. away. Yeah. And that, I think, is the magic of the orchestra. Yeah. But we led up to it with a piece for strings, a piece for percussion alone. Mm. I mean, you don't very often get to experience percussion by itself or just the right. woodwinds by, its, by themselves. Brilliant. So it was a way to kind of expose them to all the elements of the orchestra and then mm -hmm. say, okay, then here's the entire plate full of sound. Mm, and you know, I, I think that that warms it up, not only for people who've gone to concerts for years, but people who haven't, and they say, mm. oh wow, this is a live experience. Mm. I equate it very much with a, you going to museums, and I'm sure you're, you're really aware that in the last 20 years, the whole approach has become a lot more user-friendly. Mm -hmm. They assume that people don't really know much about well, the exhibit, but they're right. interested. So what most people do is they get that headset thing, mm -hmm. and they go from thing to, th and they get some education. Right, right. I think the arts uh, have come to realize that they have to do that yes. to engage the public because the people don't have time, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. I can't really make right. an evaluation right, right. like that. They don't have time to stay connected to the long lineage of the arts. So if mm -hmm. we just serve it up in a way that they can appreciate it, then they feel not only entertained and they enjoyed it but they're enriched and then they can take that life experience elsewhere yes that's what it's all about how do you go ahead about preparing for each one of the symphony series and in particular that last one March 13th to wrap up the symphony series and of course I, I want to make sure we get into we've got a lot of big topics and funding's a big one and how viewers can sure. be involved on a yeah. volunteer basis or on donations or otherwise as you highlight it's a critical nonprofit and we also there's a lot of other things to get into but how do you prepare for the symphony series or for all of them, of course, this Sunday's event? Well, I think the, the big thing is uh, as when you plan it out at first, and I'll spend, a, and I don't think people realize the amount of commitment and, and thought it takes to do programming. Right. But you think, okay, I think people would enjoy this. This would be a way for them to appreciate and understand these things. Right. And so you set the price. Sometimes I'll get the music out and I'll set it on the table and I'll put it in order, and I'll imagine going from that piece to that piece. Mm. Oh, no, that doesn't really work, or that's redundant. Throw that out. Wow. And so it takes a long time to decide right. how it all fits together. Mm -hmm. And then once that's in play, you've got it marketed, then you pretty much that's, that's your program. Yeah. And then you've got all the organizational things. And I sort of smiled because this, uh, this last program in March was, you know, it was really pushing the limit of all of the, say, set changes and things like that because mm -hmm. you had all the musicians on the stage for the Candide Overture of Bernstein, mm -hmm. and then everybody but strings leave stage. Then mm. the strings leave the stage, we reset. And you know, it's a very complicated thing, but it's oh, all, yeah. okay, the viability of a program that provides the variety for it to be enjoyable, and you're always just sort of walking that fine line. Mm -hmm. Now for this concert this Sunday, uh, it's a way for us to feature, well, of course, uh, people may not be aware, although if they've gotten the brochures, they know. Right. We have a symphony series, which is the big orchestra okay. stuff, in our main auditorium space, the Music and Arts Center at Myrtle Beach High School, right. which is a wonderful place. It so is. People haven't been if there. folks haven't been, they yeah. really need to get in. It, it, is, uh, it is a very uh, comparable uh, space to anything you'd see in the state. I think it's better sure. than what Charleston has. Right, uh, right. It's a it's a wonderful auditorium. So uh, we have that, but we also have a, a chamber orchestra series, which would be you know anywhere from uh, twenty to thirty five musicians in okay. a more intimate setting. So this one involves uh, smaller treasures through the ages. So we'll start with a, a Brandenburg Concerto, mm -hmm. the second Brandenburg Concerto, which people will know. Right. I, I like to sort of say that kind of music is grocery store music <laughs> you know that I, I isn't there a fresh market going up in the uh, area there is yeah there and is. i remember from north carolina they right. pump that stuff in all the time oh, and yeah. make you shop you know it That's just kind of keeps you going yes. but you know the brandenburg concertos are very well known so we'll do that we'll do a haydn symphony that people probably won't know right. but he wrote a hundred more than 104 of those so mm. it's just an example of the classical period and then a wonderful piece by the great opera composer wagner 
uh, a mm. piece called Siegfried Idyll, and it was really written during the time he was writing the opera Siegfried. And of mm. course, his operas are huge, long, huge instrumentation. Yeah. But this is a wonderful little chamber piece he wrote honoring the birth of his son.